Okay. Hey, thanks everybody. I appreciate it. Uh, I'm Alexander Levy. Can you hear me in the back? Yes. Great. Okay. Uh, I'm one of the co-founders of a company called Atomwise. And we like to say that what we do is artificial intelligence for drug discovery. We apply machine learning techniques to help discover new medicines virtually. So I want to give you a disclaimer at the start, which I'm obliged to do because I work in pharmaceuticals. Uh, this presentation is a presentation for a general audience. So I'm going to assume no prior knowledge, contain many simplifications that if you've studied biology or biochemistry, you'll know that I'm making. And it's just for, for teaching and explanatory purposes. Uh, if you're a stickler and you're interested in scientific details and data, please go see our most recent uh, publication. That would be a wonderful thing to do. So uh, I'm not your doctor, I'm not your lawyer, I'm not your scientist, but I, I am hoping to entertain and enlighten you for the next uh, 10 minutes or so. So I want to start in this presentation. I'm going to tell you a couple different things today. Uh, the first thing is I want to tell you about the problems that we're looking to solve. So I want to introduce uh, some of the problems in, in what's called rational drug design or structure-based drug design, and that is how you design medicines, the way you think about designing furniture or designing a building or designing an airplane. What's the equivalent for when you're actually designing a drug? What does that look like? So I'm going to tell you a bit about those problems. Then I'm going to tell you about some of the history of how people have tried to discover new medicines using different techniques. And I'm going to try and motivate why you might want to do that with computers instead of doing all of it physically. And then I'm going to get into talking about a technology that we've developed at Atomwise called AtomNet, which is the first convolutional deep learning neural network for doing uh, rational drug design. Um, from there, I think we'll get into really the, the economics of the field. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the economics of drug discovery uh, and where a technology like AtomNet could be used to do some social good. Uh, so to begin with, one of the things I want to introduce, for those that don't know, uh, are, are really the high costs of drug development. Um, so how many millions of dollars do you think the average drug today costs to develop? How many millions uh, for the average drug in the last year? A thousand? One thousand? Any others? Thirty-seven? Changing to three thousand. Uh, well, that's actually closer to the mark. So on average, and uh, most recent statistics say, it takes about $2,500 million, $2.5 billion, to develop a single new medication and bring it to market. Um, and takes on average about 15 years, start to finish. Um, the, the field of drug development is very distinguished from a number of other fields in that it is one of the only advanced industries that has seen declining research productivity over the last several years. And what that means is if you look at industrial design, if you look at architecture, electronics design, software, every year that goes by you put a dollar in and you get more out the other end of the research pipeline. That hasn't actually been true in pharmaceuticals where every year that goes by drugs get more expensive to develop and they take longer to develop. And part of those reasons are regulatory, but a really big part of it is because today in pharmaceuticals, unlike like most other fields, the majority of the work that's done is conducted purely physically. And so in drug discovery, almost all molecules which have ever been tested in the process of drug discovery have been tested physically. And that means you're building every single prototype. A way to think about it is about the way you might think about uh, an aircraft or an airplane. Today, if you picture somebody designing an airplane, you picture them designing it in front of a computer, not in front of a drafts table or making necessarily a model. And so when Boeing goes out and it makes a new uh, 787, they don't build a thousand that they have to uh, crash or, or in other ways uh, find out that they don't work before they make it. We have simulations that tell us if a plane will fly and if it'll be quiet and efficient before we build it. And those simulations have driven research productivity. Okay, so what is the equivalent, with that background, in drug design? So this is an illustration of the kind of problem that we work on, and this is a, a problem which is something called binding affinity. So the way that many drugs work, in fact the majority of drugs, one of the key principles of how they operate is a principle called binding affinity. And put simply, what that means is, will this given molecule stick to a given protein? So in your body, there are, of course, many different proteins, and, and in bacteria and viruses and pathogens and cancer cells, and each of these proteins conduct a particular function. So, for example, you might have a protein that causes inflammation. Now, then you might find a molecule, for example, let's say aspirin, that just happens to be the right size and shape and weight and so on, that it sticks to, these, uh, to an inflammatory protein. And by sticking to it, it inhibits its activity, and all of a sudden, the activity of that protein decreases, and you're treating the disease. And this is how many antibiotics work, antivirals work, cancer medications, and so on. You're st you're one of the things that you're looking for, not the only thing, but an important thing you're looking for is to find molecules that fit in that hole. A really good analogy is this model. And we call this the key and lock model. Now, an intuition you have looking at this is that there are billions or trillions of possible keys you could make. 
So everybody understands that we can have every variation of key length and shape and so on. You might have any of those uh, pins set to any height. And so you can imagine that there are billions of keys. But any given lock on a door, like in this building, will only take a small number of keys, maybe one or two keys just for that particular lock. Right? And so in drug discovery, what we're looking for, among other things, are keys that fit the locks that we're interested in. And so you can imagine that when we're making every single molecule before we test, it would be like having warehouses full of billions and billions of keys, and you're trying every single one in a lock, one after another. And that's very akin to how we do a lot of physical, uh, what's called high throughput or wet lab screening. So our goal at, at Atomwise is to predict the keys that open or fit the lock. And in each case, each lock is a protein that corresponds to a disease. So pretty reasonable so far? Yes? OK, great. So how do we do that? Um, how many of you have heard of something called deep learning neural networks? Great, that's a lot of people. All right, so you're probably familiar that deep learning neural networks are one of the premier machine learning techniques in the last few years. And they've allowed us to achieve amazing breakthroughs. Um, speech recognition, for example, was around for a very long time. Today, it's very reliable in an untrained fashion in everybody's pockets. Um, one of the reasons is, is many of those systems rely on deep learning neural networks. Autonomous cars, for example, advanced image recognition, computer vision, many of those are, are based on deep learning neural networks. And what is it about deep learning that's allowed them to achieve these great things? Well, this is an illustration of deep learning that's used for uh, face detection. One of the interesting characteristics of, of deep learning uh, is the fact that it can take very complex concepts and compose them out of smaller and smaller and smaller uh, concepts to capture something very complicated. So for instance, if I were to ask you to write a series of rules that define what a face is, you could start trying to write them all out, but it gets pretty complicated very fast. Similarly, if you wanted to define a series of rules that lets you recognize any single word in the English language, that's a very large number of rules. We need to take this concept and decompose it. So in this instance, what you do is create a neural network that has many layers, and we might start with raw pixels of an image, compose those pixels into patches that form edges, like diagonal and vertical edges, as you see here, and then compose those edges into pieces of faces, for example, like noses and mouths and eyes, and then finally, in the final frame, assemble all of those together to form a concept of a face. And so the question that we asked ourselves about three years ago when we started doing this work was, could we do the same thing, but for chemistry, organic chemistry, and for drug discovery? So the same technology that differentiates if an image is a dog or a cat, or a waveform is a cat or a car, could we look at a molecule in a binding pocket on a protein and say, is this a binder or a non-binder? So that's, that's what we tried to do. Now, I should also mention that there's a great social motivation for this as well. And one of the great social motivations for this is that the rising cost of drug discovery has meant that many, many diseases unaddressed or underaddressed. So as you can well imagine, if it costs two and a half billion dollars to develop a new medicine, and it's, let's say, for a disease primarily suffered by people who are poor, or it's a very rare disease, for example, or a disease that's proven to be intractable in the past, uh, companies very rationally might say it's not worth the investment to make. And so a technology potentially that could do what I've just described to you could help change that cost curve and therefore help address that social issue. So I'm very happy to say that that was the goal of what we set out to do, and that's in fact exactly what we've done. Uh, it's a technology that exists today, <laughs> and it's called AtomNet. And so far, AtomNet has produced some very interesting results. So if you go back a little bit and you recall that picture I showed you of faces and face parts, what would be the equivalent for organic chemistry? Well, what you would look for is to see that the system had taught itself the kind of basic building blocks and concepts that you might learn as a chemist or somebody going to school for chemistry or organic chemistry. And in fact, that's exactly what AtomNet does. This is an illustration of a part of AtomNet's network activating on a group. Um, those familiar will recognize this as a sulfonamide group. And a sulfonamide group is a functional group that exists in many different antibiotics. And it has learned to recognize this pattern autonomously by itself, along with many others, such as aromaticity, different kind of carbons, for example, solvent volume. All of these are important concepts that you're taught and learn uh, in school as someone studying chemistry. And AtomNet taught them to itself by looking at millions or tens of millions of data points about the interaction of molecules and proteins. So in, in effect, as we like to say in, in a recent article we published, it's teaching itself some, some college chemistry autonomously. And that's pretty remarkable. But in addition to that, if we wanted to know if AtomNet was working, how would we do that? What could we do beyond what I just showed you? Well, another way you could do it is to try and create a very hard test and to see if your AI system could solve that test. So such a test exists. It was created at UCSF, and it's called Dude. It's a very interesting test. Some people call it DUD E, but we prefer to call it Dude. And it stands for Database of Useful Decoys Enhanced. Uh, and what that is, is they took 102 of these protein targets that I mentioned, 
across all different categories. So everything from HIV targets to antibiotic targets, cancer targets, cardiovascular targets, pain targets, and across all these different protein classes. And these are real targets that have been that real medicines exist for today. And for each of these proteins, there are a list of molecules, some many thousands of molecules. Some of them are the actual medication that today is used for that for that protein. Um, and also molecules that are known to be strong binders, good interactors with that protein. But then there are also thousands and thousands of decoys. These are molecules that are about the same size, about the same shape, same weight, same charge, but they're poor binders. They're decoys meant to fool your system. And your system has to be very intelligent to tell effectively the true actives from, from these decoys. And if you can do that, you're doing something that is directly analogous to doing that drug discovery process of high throughput screening, separating the winners from the losers with a high degree of accuracy. And so I'm happy to say that, that AtomNet performs and gives the world's best results on that for any technology of this kind. In fact, for the vast majority, uh, of, for the majority of those targets and, and the vast majority of the molecules in the training set, uh, we are able to separate the true actives from all of the others. Um, even when we go to, to great attempts to blind the system to large portions of any training data that would let it prepare for either the targets or the molecules. And so that means it's achieving a great computational result. Now, this is the point where you might stop and say, Alexander, it's all good and well that you have these great virtual results, and it's all good and well that it's learning interesting things. Have you actually used it to predict anything that might one day become a medicine? Because um, that's really where the rubber meets the road. And so that's the final thing I wanted to tell you about before we switch over to talk briefly about the economics and, and, and the social impact that follows from this technology. Um, and the answer is yes. Uh, AtomNet has actually been in active use for the last two years. Our most recent generation of the technology has been used for about two years in more than 14 different therapeutic areas. Um, and I want to share two of those case studies with you today of molecules that came directly out of the system I just described, that rationale I just described. Uh, the first is in multiple sclerosis. Multiple sclerosis, as you know, is uh, still in many ways an unsolved disease, particularly uh, progressive MS, is, is very, very hard to treat. And so we have a, a very urgent need for better and, and more ways to approach it. So our collaborators in this case came to us with a novel target. It's a protein-protein target. For those that work in biology, you know that's a very difficult interaction because you have to come in between two proteins. It's a very complex interface. And, and Adam, uh, and Adam Wise screened several million molecules. In fact, we can screen more than a million molecules per day with our system, um, which if you've done wet lab screening or physical screening or, uh, with a pipette, for example, you can understand that a million molecules per day uh, is a very substantial throughput. Um, and out of the uh, about 8.2 million that we screened for this project, a number of those molecules went into testing. They wound up producing um, very, very good results in a cell-based assay. And then actually, I'm very happy to say that just a few weeks ago, uh, our first animal study of this concluded. Now, there are questions, of course, and I imagine in this audience around the ethics of animal studies. Unfortunately, they remain the gold standard, and they're sort of unavoidable for some of this development. But I'm very happy to say that in the multiple sclerosis mice that were used in this study, the molecule that was predicted out of atomwise produced absolutely stunning results. Um, very, very good results in terms of preventing the progression of MS and prolonging the lives of those mice, and doing so at a human equivalent dose uh, of 10 milligrams um, per day, and that being a, a very, very high level of potency for those familiar. And that's a molecule that came right out of an artificial intelligence system directly and was not modified through future medi for, for follow-on medicinal chemistry, actually. Predicted right out of the system. So great result. Um, the second one I'll tell you about, probably the one that we're best known for, is Ebola. Uh, in November 2014, the Ebola epidemic was at its peak, and we thought we should try to do something about that. Um, and what we decided to do was what's called a drug repurposing project. Um, as you probably know, it's often the case that new uses are discovered for old medicines, so for, or, or molecules that have unintended targets. So for example, um, does anyone know uh, the molecule sildenafil? Do we know the brand name for that? Does anybody know it? Yes. Viagra, that's right. Um, so that started life, actually, as a blood pressure medication, uh, a, a obstructive pulmonary disease medication. And it turns out that it did, in fact, uh, interact with blood vessels and blood flow, but in a way that we didn't necessarily expect as it was first being developed. Uh, and this happens all the time. Aspirin, of course, started life as a pain and fever medication and now is used to prevent heart disease, the other way around, maybe. You might think of it that way. Um, so what we wanted to ask with this project was, are there any medicines sitting in a pharmacy today that have the as yet unknown side effect of blocking Ebola infection or treating your Ebola infection? Kind of a cool question, but you can ask it with a technology like this. 
So we took about 8,000 medications, which were phase two and later approved uh, and approved medications all around the world. And we ran them through our system against a target, which is the protein that Ebola uses to infect cells. So it has a claw-like mechanism that's on the end of it. This is many strands of Ebola that it uses to get into the cell. We thought we could park a molecule in there and sort of keep it out here swinging, unable to get into the cell. So out of those 8,000, we predicted 17 that went into physical testing. This was live uh, hybrid Ebola virus, live human cell testing. So, so really very close to the real deal. Um, and out of those 17, uh, one of those blocked Ebola infection by as much as 88%. It's a very, very high result. And that has since been reproduced in multiple Ebola strains from different epidemics. And so now we're in a position where the results are promising enough that uh, we're awaiting entry into a... Um, a BSL-4 facility that will let us test this with real live uh, unmodified Ebola. And so that's another molecule in prediction that came directly out of the system. So now I want to flip over and for the concluding part of this presentation, talk about what this means socially and, and economically and to give you some sense for how you can think about this industry if you're coming to it from a different area uh, or pharmaceutical development or drug development aren't quite your area of expertise. So there's a couple key concepts that I want to put in your heads. The first is the concept of the pipeline. You've probably heard of, of the drug discovery uh, pipeline. And so individual companies in the overall industry, you can think of there being uh, a large funnel. Many millions of molecules go in the top, and over time, through subsequent testing and experimentation, they get winnowed and winnowed and winnowed to the few dozen new molecules that get approved each year. So what starts as a big torrent of molecules winds up at the end of it like a bit of a drip, where a couple of us could probably count on, on, on our hands the number of molecules that actually become medicines in any given year. Um, and that rate of attrition critically drives the economics of pharmaceuticals, which is you spend a lot of money uh, for each one, as I mentioned. And so that's one of the main drivers that, that hold us back in many ways from tackling diseases that, that are very urgent that we need to tackle uh, because of those high costs. There's another concept I want to put in your head. Uh, does anyone know who this band is? Okay, anyone? Okay. All right. So in, 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 in December 1964, uh, they had a hit that was number one on the charts called I Want to Hold Your Hand. We all know it. Um, let me flip forward here. Does anybody know who this band is? Nobody knows who this band is. This is the Dave Clark Five. And in January, of, uh, in January the following January, uh, their number one hit knocked I Want to Hold Your Hand off the singles charts. They're all British. They were all signed to another major record label uh, in the UK. And superficially, they look a lot like the Beatles. Um, but as we know, it's this band, the Beatles, that are committed to history. Uh, what does this have to do with drug discovery? What it has to do with is this is actually very similar to what it's like to try and guess the odds of molecules in development, um, which is at the start, you might have different molecules, uh, all of which kind of look about the same. They look reasonable. They're going after the same targets. They might have similar scaffolds. And one of them turns out to be the Beatles. Uh, and one of them turns out to be the Dave Clark Five. Um, and this is really how, how it feels in many ways from a medicinal chemistry perspective to try and figure out which will be which. And so even if you were an expert music producer, top of your field, plenty of people turned these folks down for a record contract. And so what does that motivate us to think? It motivates us to think that another critical problem that we need to solve is the ability to have judgment and insight into which molecules are most likely to succeed and which are most likely to fail before we go to the lengths of testing them uh, for many hundreds of millions of dollars or billions of dollars over a period of 5 or 10 or 15 years. And that's somewhere where computational technologies can play a critical role. And so what we're hoping is that we're going to be part of a new generation. And that generation is a generation of companies that finally brings to bear the promise of computational drug discovery. Um, as many of you who've worked in the field probably know, computational drug discovery has a very long and, and in some ways very disappointing history. It's been a dream for a long time. And while other fields have fallen uh, to simulation, which has greatly improved them, things like architecture and industrial design and electrical engineering and so on, uh, it remains the case that drug development is one of the most uh, physical and wet uh, fields of, of, of work out there. And so with AtomNet, what we're trying to do is go after these diseases. And indeed, we've got a number of projects in the pipeline that are hoping to make just that impact. Um, a number of projects that we've looked at and will be looking at, and everything from antibiotics to antivirals um, to neglected diseases and even very rare and orphan genetic diseases, which are now, we hope, going to be more tractable and easier to solve uh, using artificial intelligence. And so we hope that that will, in the next several uh, years and several decades, make a big economic impact um, and just as importantly, a very large social impact. So that's AtomWise, and uh, thank you for letting me present to you today. I would be happy to take any questions you have uh, and any remaining time uh, that's available. Thank you.